Hello, everyone, and welcome back. And now we're going to hear from Andres Levac, who is a partner from White and Case on market trends in licensing and mergers and acquisitions. Over to you, Andres. Yeah, thank you very much. So, um, you know, for, first of all, I, I, I hope everybody is, is safe and healthy. It, it's been a trying several past, past, past months and very difficult for everybody, I, I have to say. And, and, it, and it has had a deal impact um, and, and it took some time to, to, to see exactly what, what, that, what that impact has been. Um, but, but, you know, largely, you know, I think it all stems from what we're seeing and, and I'm sure has been discussed to some extent earlier today and, and in previous meetings yesterday, that there is an acceleration of trends that were in society and the economy prior to this. And the, the pandemic seems to almost in a, ironically in a synergistic way, accelerated some of these trends and, you know, it's forced us to live, uh, and, and, and work differently, um, remotely, obviously, uh, <laughs> sitting here, uh, you know, half a you know, uh, an ocean away from the from the, from the conference that was supposed to be in Brussels in person, uh, and and at the same time it's also changed our industry uh, in, in in a number of ways. And I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of that, and then come across some other interesting topics that layer layer into it. So one of the biggest things that we've uh, you know if you if you're paying attention to to the stock market at all is it's at least from a U.S. perspective, is surprisingly high, uh, you know, given that what's going on in the economy, exactly the real economy, and what from our perspective, what seems to be happening and what is happening to our clients doing deals, um, yeah, the firm that I work with, it, work at is 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 one of the larger corporate uh, uh, M and A private equity firms globally, and what we're seeing is that the liquidity that's been infused into the economy really being pushed through every corner of the financial system. And as a result of that, seeing asset prices and deal prices really pushing up quite high. And you know, to the point where we, you know, we've noticed that in our private equity practice, that some of the pricing uh, our clients are being faced with as they're bidding uh, to, to try to participate in deals yeah, they're they're kind of getting priced out, or or in a sense, at least historically sensible way, getting priced out, where multiples are pushing very very high, relative to certainly current or expect any near term expected earnings, and what that seems to be doing is you 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 you're having money from you know again for the sort of let's say the pharmaceutical biotech side of the industry, you're starting to see money come towards investment in that part of the industry that typically wouldn't come there, right? So a private equity group tends to focus on EBITDA positive, in other words, uh, uh, cash flow positive um, uh, uh, businesses and, and with, with a mo modest, let's say a modest amount of risk or a moderate amount of risk with, uh, you know, a near term return to revenue. And, and you know, they, they tended to stay away from the biotech larger risk items, longer term risk questions that the VCs, uh, would, you know, would, VCs and strategics would typically get into. And, and you're starting to see that move, move in their direction, right? Because they're having a hard time putting money to work where they really put money to work. So they're looking for riskier and riskier things. They're willing to take a chance on more complex things that they would traditionally stay away from. And so that is pushing money towards the biotech pharma side of things. At the same time, the other thing that everybody's noticed, and, and our firm is quite active in, is, is these SPACs. These, 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 these are these companies uh, without assets that are created and listed, and then they go do an M&A deal. And so, you know, and, and some of that is actually pushing into biotech pharma, surprisingly. So these are ways you can list your company through these, uh, through these SPAC entities. And so, you know, so that's trend number one. You know, I, I think we're 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 seeing a, a, a real strong influx of money 
um, in, in, into sort of the pharma biotech side of things in ways that's a little unusual. And, and so what does that mean, right? So that means if you're, if you're negotiating a deal as a strategic, you may be, you know, that, that you may be bidding against things, you know, financial entities that, that traditionally maybe you didn't have to compete with to, to if, you're, if you're thinking about acquiring something here. On the other hand, it's an opportunity as well, right? So the, the pharmaceutical industry, you know, the midsize and larger pharmaceutical industry particularly goes through cycles of divestment. Um, and, and what this could be is a really great opportunity to divest, let's say, the more mature side of a business, a product portfolio, um, uh, you, you, you know, where there's perhaps less uh, of the, let's say, biotech type risk uh, involved or, 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 or some other more stable cash flow positive, you know, r relatively straightforward to model side of the business that still has a lot more risk than, let's say, healthcare play, pure healthcare provider play. Uh, you know, there may be a, the, quite a number of private equity players out there who would be very interested in taking that off the hands of pharma now. And so, you know, the, the pharma industry kind of goes through these waves of, of build, building up a conglomerate and then kind of shrinking back down to a core. And so this could be a, a, an interesting window of time in, in, the, in this kind of odd business, odd part of the business cycle that we find ourselves in where that, that could be an attractive set of, of deals to be, to be made. So I, I think that's, that's sort of high, high level, really, you know, sort of interesting um, uh, trend, trend, trend number one. So let, let's also in, talk a little bit about digital health. And I was, I was happy to hear and kind of view the, the previous presentation, um, uh, you know, including for my clients, the Novartis perspective and, and mentioning some of the other things going on in digital health as well. Um, and, and, you know, having, having done a number of deals for Ver Verily and others in, the, in, in digital, you know, I, I agree with many of the comments that were shared there. That was a useful discussion. What, but from a trend perspective, what I wanted to highlight uh, to the extent it already hasn't been is that, look, it's, it's obviously there's been this huge boost to telemedicine globally. And there's, there's, there's perhaps it's actually taking off. Uh, the, the, what, in digital, the biggest question uh, you know, has been, you know, first of all, one big question in digital is what is it, right? I mean, this is a whole variety of different things. Telemedicine is sort of on the one end of things that is on the healthcare provider side of it. Um, but there's a whole variety of things and strategies and techniques people are trying in, in the broader umbrella of digital. Um, and it, it, uh, one of the big impediments, there's two, there's really been two big impediments to it. One, one of which is a reg, you know, regulatory blockages, things, you know, you're trying to do something potentially significantly different in a regulated space that involves human health, and you know regulators are cautious, right? And they're they're not going to just allow anything to happen, and so it, it it has been a little slow to to move in that direction. Telemedicine historically has been a bit held back, uh, particularly because of those regulatory reasons as well, and it just you know, because you're actually giving healthcare advice in this remote setting. There's also anti-competitive reasons, perhaps, why doctors don't want to see competition locally from people kind of, you know, telecommuting in into their market. Uh, and so, but but the, the pandemic has necessitated change and has freed things up. And, and there there is this as it was mentioned in the previous discussion, uh, you know, moving quickly, um, and 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 that has opened up some of these windows to to actually do more, and and that has uh, been very interesting. the The hard thing about it is maybe to just two two observations here. One is that you t when you're doing a deal in digital health. Typically what's happening is you have two different companies coming together who have very different core competencies and you end up having to educate one another on, on, on the other's role. And you know, so for example, I've got the, 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 the technology company, the company who's very facile with data and data analysis coming together with the company who's very facile with do, dealing with the human body and human risks and healthcare. And 
a very different appreciations for for uh, uh, liabilities and for risks, and 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 and, and that leads to a diff, sometimes a difficult negotiation. I mean, you, you really need to, you know, l appreciate where the other is standing and listen. You really, you really got to listen. And in, in, in a good transactional setting, you're, you're teaching each other and you're, you're learning from each other and you really be able to come together. It is generally a challenging negotiation because of that, that, that it is not a a well-trodden path. I mean, people started working in digital health about seven years ago. At least that's when Google started working on it quietly and others in the industry as well. So some of these some of these players have been doing it for quite some time. They have a sense for what's market internally. I don't know that that's quite you know, become externally more broadly well-known, but that, that type of um, Interaction, it is a little challenging. There, there is also difficulty in negotiating exclusivity arrangements, because it is sometimes difficult to understand and appreciate who, who, who exactly is going to be competing with who after this is done or at the next phase of this. Um, are you creating a competitor, or enabling a competitor, and that that would lend itself to a different kind of transaction potentially if you knew that was going on. But the biggest thing that's sitting in the background is the last bit on the slide here is how do you make money doing this? You know, what, what is the route to reimbursement? Um, um, you know, it's the, in, in, in the normal life sciences, pharma product setting, we, we have a pretty good idea on, 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 you know, how products make money, you know, whether it's drugs or medical devices or combinations of the two. And, um, it, or at least you know where the risks are. And you know who to go talk to. You know what kinds of arguments to to to, to have with the regulators after you get medical approval to to get the pricing you want to get, and, and what kinds of evidence you're going to need. It's it, it is very difficult to think about sometimes the commercial end of the digital health product pipeline, and and that is the, you know, having been an economist before I became an attorney. Um, you know, one of the things that I've been focused on for quite some time, and you know, we're 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 working on some transactions now in digital where we're that that is our role. I mean, frankly, I mean, the, you know, we're bringing all the corporate law and everything else to kind of build the joint venture, but we're very focused on structuring the relationship and and particularly the parameters in the deal, so that there's a way, a pathway forward to monetization. And and to, to you know for the smaller players uh, in this one transaction, for example, to to exit you know at a reasonable fair valuation, and 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 so there is um, a way in which to to drive things forward. It so anyway, let I, let me move off that topic into the next one that that has very much come to the fore um, in digital as well. So. And this is again about money um, to some extent. And so this is about affordability and access. So, so, uh, so I've done work for, mo mostly I do work for the for-profit uh, pharmaceutical biotech medical device industry, but some, some of my clients for a number of years have been nonprofits as well um, in the industry, these, these product development nonprofits. And, um, and and this year, so so you know we've done a number of deals in COVID this year, un, 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 unsurprisingly, and some of them, or or actually all of them, the topic of afford, drug affordability and access has been, you know, one, one of the most important topics in a deal. Actually, rather difficult uh, to to negotiate in in some ways. Um, m many of the deals involving COVID have governmental um, of Funding involved somewhere um, or in the background in terms of uh, you know a grant of rights, and and they're using and, and inappropriately so the governments are using their role there in assisting to insist upon um, uh, some level of control on on the the, the price uh, of any resulting drug and 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 the availability and and it's generally it, it falls on this category. You know, topic of affordability and access. And so maybe let me back up a little bit and just explain what th th these can be difficult to negotiate. And, and it's, 
if if you've only ever done just sort of normal for-profit pharma biotech deals, this is uh, a, this is a little bit of a strange topic. So it, what what one needs to think about is that in a in a standard deal, what, you know, there's just a lot of profit maximization going on on both sides, and and you're balancing different kinds of risks. And um, what we're looking at here in this setting is that you what you, you what, they're maximizing on something other than profits, essentially. Right? And, and so what they're what what your counterparty, what your NGO, what your what your governmental counterparty, or or what your nonprofit uh, counterparty is maximizing on, they, they want to try to get the drug into as many hands as possible. And at, at lowest price possible. Now that's still a trade-off. You can't you can't just drive the price to zero and, and availability to 100. I mean that that that's that that does not uh, ultimately work. And so there is a balance, just like any other good negotiation. It's about figuring out what your counterparty wants and how do you, how do you balance it as part of the overall deal matrix. And the, the specific types of things that are, that are negotiated on both affordability and access, they tend to vary uh, a bit, but, but the overall topic has, has to do with trying to, in, uh, there's a couple of different ways of doing it, but you're trying to give comfort on pricing so that the, 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 there is some limitation on pricing um, or, or, or direction for the price to be lower than it otherwise would be. And you're also, there, there is a commitment beyond just sort of pure price. There is this idea of, hey, are you, number one, are you actually gonna launch in all the markets where it's approved? And then how quickly, uh, okay? So these are sort of diligence type requirements. But then beyond that, are you able to provide sufficient supply? And if you're not, what happens, right? So it's some of this is, it's drafted and negotiated in a manner of a, what's the remedy, right? And if you don't, if you don't achieve whatever these goals and these metrics might be, um, so you know, I, it's I think it's it's it, it 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 some of this has been quite challenging to negotiate, but it, but important. It wouldn't surprise me if if one of the sticking points or one of the things that we see come out of the pandemic longer term is a little bit more attention in this direction. I mean, there's there's obviously been a lot of attention paid to drug pricing generally, um, you know, for, 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 for many years, um, but to actually see it in the deals as a diligence point, as, as something to be thought of, um, that, that, that's a little different. I mean, it, there's more direct government involvement in some of these as well. So that that's, that's driving it. So I'm going to push on to the next uh, topic here, and and so some of this is 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 a little um, obvious, but you know we are working. You know how how are deals being actually done differently, right? So we're working asynchronously, and and our teams are all over the place. I I you know and that was difficult at first as everybody adjusted to this. I I I think at this point though, you know having done this for several months. I think that's actually working pretty well. I think it, my my sense is that having you know interacting with different clients and different continents that the asynchronous work and not being in the same place, not not being able to walk down the hallway, people seem to have fully adjusted to that. What what is still um, challenging though, it, it needs to everybody needs to work at is like just issue tracking and follow up. It does everything does seem to take a little longer still to get done. And and so um, you know, just you know, going going into I guess the 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 point the takeaway point here is if you're going to go into a transaction, just be careful with the timeline that you're promising, you know, to management and 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 leaving on the calendar that it's going to take longer than it did before. Uh, it just does, and um, it you know the it is also perhaps. A little bit more challenging to negotiate this, you know, when you sit face to face in the same room, which you know can't can't really do safely right now. Um, that it is, you get to a better deal quick, quicker because it's it's hard. It's generally speaking harder to be aggressive you know, in person where you can touch somebody. Um, if you're on the phone, it's and and by video, perhaps less so. But but so it's generally easier to be more aggressive, and that tends to drag negotiations out if, you, if you're not incentivizing, you know, good negotiating behavior, try to get to the middle. Um, 
So the, that that's one way. But but I think the other way. This, this is the last slide, and then there's one topic I'm going to add to the end of this. Is that there, there? There's a bunch of new risks we're worried about in deals now. And, and uh, you know, to some extent, these risks were always there in the background to begin with, and we're just sort of balancing them differently, right? But certainly we have more government, direct government involvement in, in, in the COVID-related deals. Um, and and, that, that's a pro and, and that, that leads to the emphasis on affordability and access and, and the like as well. And, and also, you're, when you're de you know, dealing with some of these governmental entities, you're negotiating more, you're negotiating with counterparties who, who just aren't as facile with negotiations. They, just, they just don't do this with the same level of regularity and then obviously in this, in this, in this environment as well. So I think that that's, that's certainly a new risk and a new challenge. The other thing that we're certainly seeing also is globally, there's a lot more, you know, there's this quite a, quite a surge on foreign direct investment regulation and trade regulation. And, and, and there's, some some antitrust things that are popping up, and I think with the new administration that uh, should be taking uh, 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 you know taking over in Washington in the U.S. Uh, in January, um, you know where I think we're going to see an increase in antitrust regulation in the U.S. as well, and the the FDI uh, you know, foreign direct investment regulation that that very much matters for M and A deals um, and, and and the like, and so you have to be very careful. And if you're moving, so if you're moving any kind of a sensitive technology or or potentially sensitive technology back and you know, between you know cross border, it's going to be an issue. I, I look and the vaccine, even just vaccine and therapeutic antibody technology is viewed as being sensitive at this point. You know, given the implications for COVID, so I think that that is definitely a new risk. And and so just ch check if you're doing a deal, check to see if it applies. You know, it, depending on the jurisdictions and exactly what's going on in the deal, be very careful about date-based diligence. Okay, it, any kind of anything that's setting an outside date on a calendar, I think, is a much greater risk of breach than than, than, than prior to the pandemic. I mean, just to, again, things are taking longer to get done, which is you know pretty 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 evident, and. Um, if you have a contract where you have fixed date date timeline, it, it you know it's going to be a hard. You're going to have a hard time meeting it. So what you can try to do instead is build in reasonable amounts of time that are keyed off of actual factual eventing rather than uh, dates on a calendar to try. So you can still try to have a a timeline based diligence, but just have it key off of the of, off of off of actual uh, development achievements ra rather than sort of a fixed point, I, you know, depending on which side of the argument you're on, but it, be, be careful with it. Just be wary of that. Uh, it should go uh, to be, be no surprise to see that supply chain risk uh, is, is, is <laughs> suddenly tech ops and supply chain are, are uh, very important. Uh, people want to keep things flowing and uh, we'll see how the, how some of these, uh, first vaccines, how the distribution ch channels work, how efficiently they work, and can, you know, can they keep it cold enough and, and the like. So that, you know, th that's been a bit of an under-resourced area um, in the industry for some time, and, it, and and it's good to see that it's getting the attention that it that that, that it currently um, needs. And so, just you know, that certainly that's been. Uh, a big negotiating point um, in, in many deals. And let me add one interesting risk at the end here um, that we were just talking to some of your colleagues, uh, you know, let's say a colleague company in Europe about yesterday, uh, which is bankruptcy. And, and the, so, so that the, the pharmaceutical industry is actually, parts of the pharmaceutical industry are coming under threat of direct bankruptcy and insolvency and restructuring themselves. And what's, uh, you know, so it's, so it's a little unfortunate to see, but, but also not surprising. So COVID has had a whole bunch of economic impacts. And as you might imagine, one of the things that, that it's done is if you're trying to launch a new drug, and you can't have your sales reps out there detailing and doing everything you need to do to have a success launch. What that 
tends to do is to make it more difficult to commercialize. And, and so while it's, while it's always a challenge and a very, very big risk when you're launching a new product, um, those risks are greater now. And uh, there's at least one instance, and I suspect there's actually probably several, um, in the industry where some of these launches this year or, or even launched last fall ran into difficulties. And that is putting a strain on the companies that were betting on and relying upon the success of those launches. And so what that then does is, got, you know, this is, this is like, you know, dominoes falling. And so you've got, there are some distressed companies out there. And now the counterparties to those companies are, are, are facing a, a prospect of a, of a, of a collaboration partner or other transactional partner who may be tipping towards insolvency or bankruptcy. And so the, so that's the bad news. The good news is there was a really good Supreme court case last year in the United States that clarified a very long-standing question of us bankruptcy law and, and in the way that helps us do deals. And the, 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 the current law in, in the United States for, and this is mainly helping doing work in, with, with, let's say, a U.S. smaller company, um, is that you can rely on your deal from a licensing point of view. So if you're a European company doing a deal with a U.S. biotech, if the U.S. biotech tips in the bankruptcy under current law, that means that you will be able to maintain your license rights. It, it, in bankruptcy, even if we're talking about, say, just purely German patent rights, German even trademark rights are now protected under under this new U.S. Supreme Court ruling, and so you can hold your license rights. Now, what you won't be able to do, as is typical in any insolvency or bankruptcy, is to require the require the small company to continue to spend money to continue to uh, make efforts if it doesn't want to or can't. Um, but at least it, it, the, the case, uh, this is the U U.S. Supreme Court case, Tempology, um, helps answer the question, am, am I going to lose my franchise? Uh, and that really was a, quite a question for a number of years. Um, so, the, so there is some, 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 some assurance there at, at least. So, uh, so Caroline um, and, and Lena, so I think I'm going to uh, wrap up there and um, turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Andres. Uh, that was a really interesting walk through the current trends. And I think it's going to be an exciting time for us with the increased liquidity and new innovation in, in the market. And I, I think we need to think as lawyers how best to prepare for um, getting deals through quickly in the face of uh, increasing regulation. So thank you very much uh, for your insights. Thank you. Thank you.